So today I'll present one of our works called Hairbrush. It's a mixed reality app for hair color try-on. So let's proceed. Let me first start by introducing my team. So it's me, Daniel, George, and Vital. So we're based in Johns Hopkins University. And basically, I do most of the research. George, George does mobile development, and Vital helps with supervision. We also have a main scientific advisor. It's Nasir Nawab. He's also a professor at TUM and Johns Hopkins. So let's get back to the topic. So the goal is basically just to enable users to try on different hair colors and different hairstyles in the real time on their mobile app. There's a couple of challenges we face when we try to do this. So it should be flexible. So basically, you should be able to do it on your mobile devices. Doesn't matter which mobile device you have, like Android, iPhone. It should be done in real time. So you'd, you'd better like, be able to do this in real time from your phone from different angles. So it should work robustly, like here and there. And also, it should be high quality. So imagine like you want to try on a different hair color. You take a picture, you share it on your social media, and you see how your friends react to it. So, and then you see, oh, this, this hair color like, really like, looks nice, and my all of my friends liked it. So why don't I make it? So I'll go like a little bit on the our, our approach outline. So it's basically consisted of three main building blocks or pillars, if you may. So it's data annotation, uh, segmentation architecture search, and applying hair color to the selected region. I'll go like about all these separate stages in more details. So data annotation consisted of us creating the good enough and like huge enough data set of training images. On the right, you can see how it was actually created. So we made it. We made our custom custom tool to annotate this, and basically hired annot professional annotators to do this. And we open source a lot of like a lot of things that we did. So we believe in open source. So and we share it with the community. So next task after we we got the acquired this data is to do actual segmentation. So if you saw this example of an image and annotation, later on we teach the network to do this for ourselves. So on the left the leftmost side is you can see the input image on the right, like in the middle you can see the output of the network. And now basically we want to do it automatically and then apply color. So to do this in real time, we have to apply co uh, uh, approach called neural architecture search. Basically it helps us to uh, build a network which runs almost in real time on any device. So to do this, we basically take a building blocks which our network consists of from. We benchmark each of them, measure the latency in milliseconds, and basically use it in a main part, which is like main part of our algorithm called neural architecture search. It basically tries to choose the uh, paths in your networks in, in your network and drew, prune out some of them and just leave the most <coughs> important ones while achieving the uh, desired latency. So we were able to achieve uh, one fr 100 fr frames per second on iPhone 7s. So the next task which we faced was how do we make the uh, color look more natural? So if you just naively recolor the selected region, it usually doesn't really work. So we applied a, a little bit more sophisticated uh, technique called histogram specification. So it allows users to specify desired style and then basically through the whole the process of our application, we, we transfer this style to the target region of the image. So here you can see some of the results we acquired. So some of the like, uh, styles are really crazy. Some of them are like just more standard. So basically you can choose whatever you like. Uh, let me touch upon of a future work we, we are aiming at is that we will also want to try like, to provide users with different hairstyles, not only colors. Uh, we also want to do makeup and uh, basically extend it a little bit more for clothing and try to make our approach end to end. So uh, currently our approach consists of intermediate stages, but we also want to make it end to end and avoid these intermediate stages. So basically, thank you. If you want to contact me, this is my email address. And basically, I conclude with the results of our algorithm. And if you guys want to try the real, real time demo on my iPhone, approach me after the talk. So it works on my iPhone, so you can see how it works. Also, the scientific paper that I cited here we are releasing everything in a week, so feel free to talk about this too. I'm open to any discussions. Thank you, everyone, and if you have any questions. All right. Thank you. Come on over here and a little sure, bit in the sure. middle. You're the star, not me. Right there. <laughs> okay, judges, who wants to ask some questions? You guys have mics, you can trade. Yeah, sure. go for it. Hello? Okay. Um, so I have a question about the color of the hair. So yeah. you mentioned that you do a color transform to make it more realistic. Yeah, yeah, how yeah. are you gauging um, whether or not the hair color is realistic? Do you have a, a measure for it, or is it just all based on your personal opinion? So there was a lot, like, a lot of techniques we tried. And we basically did some kind of a like, user study at hand. 
So the most natural hair color, like we had a pattern and we tr transferred it to a different like different hair like hairs. And basically just by looking at it, there is no metric like basically to answer your question correctly, but basically we did a small user study. We asked people to compare like look at the provided style and not look at how it was transferred. So basically we did a small user study and we found out that this approach works the best. It's not the best one, but it was the best out of what we tried. So yeah, thank you for the question. It's actually a really good question. Sure. Hadley. Uh, are you thinking about this being a consumer app or more an SDK that folks in the beauty industry would, would use? So, so far we focused only on the approach, like to make it work in real time. It can be both at, at this point of time, but it can be like an add-on to Snapchat or some other applications. Yeah, we we're like looking at other possibilities. So far it's just like a core product that we have and we're looking at other like applications. So like maybe we'll change it or like custom our product later on. Yep. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you. Well done. Next up, we have uh, Mario is going to talk about mobile analytics. Come on up here, Mario. Good luck. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. So, Platon said that human behavior flows from three main sources, desire, emotion, and knowledge. What about if we can go backward and from the emotion and knowledge, we can influence the human behavior in a positive way. So my name is Mario Quiroa. I'm presenting Mobile Analytics. I work for the Cinebox. So why is still in 2019, we are still delivering the same app for different, for different users? We are still delivering the same uh, social me uh, media for a grandma, for a woman in the 40s, and for a millennial. And we also know that everybody is different. Everybody has different necessities. So what about if we can change that? If we can create and automate a, a mobile app, depending on the user interaction, depending on the user experience. So the idea is to personalize the application for everybody. The way to do that is, first of all, uh, enable the historical data analysis and create some kind of a data source. And also, we are integrating eye gazing and uh, emotion recognition to be able to uh, study the user flow, the time of each screen, all the finger position, uh, the behavioral tracking, and finally have an, a good amount of historical UX. Why, how is going to do that? We need to grab the application inside of a new one. So at the end, we, we will have two videos. And these two videos, one is from the user interacting with the app, and one is from the app recording all the user experience. With these two, two videos, we can study all this really easy. May, you may ask, why don't use the current methods? The thing is that it's really difficult for an application to in, embed a uh, SDK on API, because some of the time you have a barrier. You have to open the code, insert the code, to track and mark all the elements you want to study, and then you can have all these results. So it is increase, of course, the software development cycles. It needs an established product. You can test on the other approach and prototype, and you can generate a security breach. So it has been done and this is uh, how it's going to be done. Of course, with the power of computer vision. <coughs> with computer vision, we can analyze the two videos, the video of the user interacting with the app and it, the U UX of the user itself. With these two videos, you can train a model, evaluate the model, and finally deliver a uh, old lady uh, a personal, uh, personalized app and a millennial, a personalized set up, depending of all the user interactions. So this is, uh, if you want more details about the technical part, uh, please free, feel free to contact me. Okay, well done. <laughs> Anybody want to kick off questions? Nabil. I'm just curious what inspired you to start working on this. Sorry? What inspired you to start working on this problem? Uh, actually, it was a client that requesting us to study 
all this study to, to analyze all the user experience. But we realized that every user has a different user path. May, some users may, may need more steps, and some users are more intuitive, so they don't need a lot of steps. So we said we, we cannot keep delivering. So we are, what we are retrieving is guidelines. So you have to, if, you, if your public objective is this, you have to do it the app like this. Any other questions, judges? Orders, there you go. So you, you've told us about how <coughs> you're going to be looking at the user um, and analyze their facial expressions so that then you can change the UX, right? Yeah. And, but you haven't told us much about how, how you will change it exactly. So for example, if the user is getting angry, or if we are recording in the video that the user is getting angry or it gets frustrated, we know that in that, point, in that point, we can change, I don't know, the, the colors, the buttons, the, the UX of that part, because in that part for that user, the user was really uh, having a really tough time. So based on these emotions, we can know in which part, or maybe in that part, in different part, later on, uh, the user is getting really uh, calm and excited with this part, so we can know why is this happening? And we can change based on that. We, we also have the eye gazing information, so we know what, what they are looking at. How does this scale? Will you have an individual solution for each user, do you think? Or will you maybe have a bunch of them and then you'll decide which one for each user? It should be a guidelines. At the end, it's, it's like more like, as I mentioned here, we have three different type of user, and uh, maybe for uh, grandma and messenger app, it should be in that way, and for a millennial, the messaging app it should be in that different way. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. Moving right along. So I, I love the. Uh, the diversity in all of our different speakers throughout the day and also our competitors. Next up is Denise with IMAD. Take it away. The number of fatal injuries in crashes where the driver tests positive for marijuana alone, no other drugs or alcohol, has doubled in those states with legal adult use of marijuana. There are 900,000 police officers across the nation that are in desperate need of technology that is objectively able to measure marijuana impairment. Earlier today, Evan commented that 90% of what the brain analyzes comes through the visual system. So it makes sense that a test to measure marijuana impairment to drive could be a visual-based test. IMAD is such a test. I'm Dr. Denise Valenti. I'm an optometrist and a neuroscientist. I have 30 years experience related to clinical applications and research in vision impairment, driving, and cognition. I invented IMAD and I hold the patent pending. Mm, backwards. We had received this year funding from, uh, in the form of an SBIR from NIH. We were able to develop our first prototype and proof of efficacy. However, it is not possible to use federal money to do cannabis research because it's a Schedule I drug and that would be illegal, so we do need help. Our proof of concept was done on an existing technology that has a normative database. It is a peripheral vision test, but instead of the traditional flashes of light, it has stripes that flicker and get dimmer and lower contrast. If a person is using marijuana, they do not see the lower contrast targets. We have a roadside ready test in the form of a virtual goggle with the test in a smartphone in front. The driver um, presses a Bluetooth button when they see stripes anywhere in their vision. Uh, the concept for IMAD is based on the known retinal dysfunction that occurs with marijuana use, and that has been reported by other groups in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Um, the person that is high cannot see the dimmer versions of those stripes you actually see there. Our um, target 
market is not just law enforcement, but of all of transportation and manufacturing. We have two strategies to bring IMAD to market. The first is selling the app direct to um, municipalities or people using it in their device. The second strategy is to license it to a company that already operates in the space. Examples are Samsung and Microsoft because they already have adapted special technology in smartphones and tablets in the law enforcement community. We price IMAT at about $1,200. This is comparable to other technology police offices purchase. Um, tasers run anywhere from $800 to $1,200. Breathalyzers for alcohol um, average around 2,000. The single technology that is available not in the United States but used in Canada and Europe to determine marijuana um, content in the system is a saliva test, and that runs $6,000. We have a team that's diverse and deep in talent and expertise. And our expertise includes Chris Hauser, who has 17 years prosecuting experience specific to marijuana impairment driving. He currently serves as the major consultant for marijuana impaired driving in both the state of Nevada and Colorado and is working in California. IMAT is truly unique and innovative. It will never replace or supplement or uh, usurp a, a biologic such as blood, saliva, or breath, it will be used in addition to. Unlike alcohol, which has a distinctly linear relationship between function and the biologic, marijuana does not have that. So an officer needs just not only to know that marijuana is on board, but also the impairment. Um, there are tests under development that measure function, but they're problematic in both safety for the officer Practicality, for example, headborne units are being researched with electrodes. Those will be easy to bypass simply by putting face creams or gels in your hair. Um, plus, they present a safety um, issue with the officer. Other technologies being developed in smartphones and tablets um, will not stand up in court due to considerations of environment, lighting, and glare. Further, they require for an older adult over the age of 40 their reading glasses. Um, IMAD works. We know this. Why? Here's our um, statistically significant data from our um, feasibility study with the FDT. What we see in red are those areas within the visual field that were significantly impaired compared to baseline with the consumption of marijuana. So it's easy to see. As you can see there, that driver would not be able to see the stop sign. So it's easy to understand why there's an increase of fatal injury, particularly not just to the driver, but to pedestrians and bicyclists. Any questions? Thank you very much. All right. <laughs> Judges, who's got questions? We're going to hear from everybody, right, today? Namil, go ahead. Have you spoken to um, officers about their capacity to buy and why they would buy or not buy? Yes, we, as part of our um, SBR, we had a, a focus group plus um, where I got my initial data before the NIH was in actual law enforcement training sessions. And what we heard, which surprised us, in the further west, the more they're concerned is, one, they don't want um, a cell phone or a tablet in the hands of a driver because it could be weaponized against their, head, their chin or chest. That's a concern. Um, they're excited about the technology because it looks simple. And once they use it, they understand it because it's basically a really, 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 really dumbed down video game. Um, and they think they can, <laughs> in a short time, explain it to somebody that's cognitively impaired, which cannabis users are at the time. All right, next question. Who hasn't asked a question yet? There we go, Francis. I was going to ask. Um, what sort of your benchmarking against today and what your accuracy rates look like, how you would deal with false, uh, I think, like positives or negatives in this case? First of all, there's le very little human data on anything um, related to cannabis. Um, so we cannot answer much of what you're asking. Um, we do know that we will have to work closely in the research and understanding chronic users. Chronic heavy, not just heavy users, but just chronic users, system has totally adapted. First of all, they're slightly impaired at baseline compared to a normative database, and their fixation ability is um, poor. So we do not know yet whether or not we'll have to change our technology and include eye tracking. Research needs to be done. We do know, though, 
that it can be sensitive and specific. We do know our pathway to the courtroom is going to be easier than another test. Um, it's not like a medical product where you have to have an endpoint of um, diagnosis and accuracy. Ours has to be accepted by a judge. And um, the criteria about impaired vision and driving is already well understood, where some other tests it's going to be a little more complicated. Any other questions? Yeah. So um, today, if, I get, if I'm driving high and under the influence and I get pulled over in the state of Washington, um, how will the officer like, know that I am under the influence of marijuana and give me a DUI? The state of Washington, unlike other states, currently has one of the higher ratios of highly trained officers. They're called drug recognition experts. Also, unlike other states, drug recognition's opinion is already registered and a judge has to accept that opinion. Other states, that's not the case. So you're going to be more at risk of a major problem than in another state, such as Massachusetts. A judge can actually refuse the testimony of an officer. So right off the bat, you're kind of toast. Um, ideally, they would have, <laughs> ideally, they would have observed that you had an erratic behavior to justify pulling you over to begin with. If that didn't occur, you're not, because a good defense lawyer will work with you and move it forward. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to get conviction, but the fact that you, um, in those states, Oregon and Washington are good examples, that you know that the officer is likely to give you a ticket, <laughs> likely to um, put you in a position to have to go to court, that's a motivator not to get in the car high to begin with. <laughs> so, you know, these are issues. Chances are with a real good lawyer currently, unless there was a fatal injury or serious property damage, you will be okay. Now, but down the road, that's not necessarily the case. All right, round of applause. Thank you very much. Well done. And our fourth, the fourth and last for this, this challenge competition is Eric from Steg AI. Take it away, Eric. Hey. Hi. I, um, I'm very proud to present uh, my startup out of Rutgers University, Steg AI, where we're solving video piracy. My name's Eric Wengrowski. I just got my PhD in computer vision from Rutgers University on Friday. <laughs> my co-founder, thank you. My co-founder is Professor Kristen Dana. She's an expert in computer vision, computational photography, and AI. And our third team member is Ron Baldwin, who's a senior business leader in the insurance and financial services industry. The content attribution market is huge. It's a global problem. But in the United States alone, video and video piracy for pay-per-view TV is an $800 million problem. Every day, TV shows, movies, pay-per-view boxing matches, all kinds of things are broadcast on live TV. And every time that happens, websites like Facebook and YouTube are bombarded with thousands of videos of users illegally up, uh, uploading pirated content. Now, the good news is that Facebook and YouTube have developed these great tools to, uh, to identify when somebody is uh, uh, uploading pirated content. But there's a big problem. They cannot identify video in video piracy. And in fact, Mark Zuckerberg, just last month in an NPR uh, news story, talked about the current failure and the need to develop video in video detection tools. Let me tell you what that means. So let's say a user's at a bar, and they're live streaming themselves, getting drinks with their friends, having a good time. And then they point the phone on their camera towards the TV. And they start live streaming a pay-per-view boxing match. That video will attract millions of uh, viewers. And Facebook will not be able to detect that they are hosting illegal content in time. This kind of video and video piracy happens hundreds of times each year. And on average, costs companies like Facebook and YouTube $20 million per event in legal exposure. So to get a better understanding of this problem, I applied for a, um, a $50,000 grant from the National Science Foundation through their i program. And in the period of six to seven weeks, I interviewed uh, 110 different people at uh, different media and 
uh, companies uh, all over the United States. We talked to Facebook, we talked to YouTube, a uh, bunch of these guys, and we determined that the biggest pain point was for uh, pay-per-view live television. <laughs> now, there's a lot of companies out there that work on watermarking and steganography, but none are able to solve this video and video problem. But this is our solution. So the video I'm playing here is actually tagged. It's watermarked with a machine-readable code that we can't see. It's invisible to us, but is detectable by your smartphone camera. This is huge. This result uh, is uh, a paradigm shift in uh, camera display communication. The secret is that we actually learn deep learning uh, algorithms to figure out how to combine an image and a message in a way that's invisible and recover it while still remaining robust to this camera display transfer. Our secret sauce is our data of over a million image pairs that I collected from uh, 25 different cameras and displays to train our network. And the results were huge. Uh, actually, we're able to uh, embed uh, information and recover it with much better error rates than every other uh, video steganography algorithm. It requires no synchronization like every other video steganography algorithm. And uh, you can see our results at CVPR this summer. Uh, in conclusion, uh, we're developing software that groups like Facebook and YouTube can integrate into their user apps. And um, we're currently seeking uh, Seed funding, we're seeking collaborators and engineers, and thank you very much. I'm very happy to present to you. Thank you very much, Eric. All right, questions, who wants to kick it off? Those that haven't said anything. Perfect, Simon. Is the, is the go-to-market, you mentioned kind of the Facebooks and the YouTubes, wouldn't you rather go through the actual content distributors and owners and then have Facebook and YouTube held liable uh, I'm struggling, I guess, just to, just to understand the incentives. Yeah, so right now, the biggest pain point is for Facebook and YouTube versus the content creators themselves, right? So content creators know and are worried about the fact that people are recording their content and distributing it illegally, but it's a lot easier for them to lean on Facebook and say, hey, you guys really have to clean up your act. Facebook currently, uh, I'm not just speaking about Facebook, but Facebook currently has relationships with content creators. So, um, they're able to say to these guys, hey, release your movies, your stuff ahead of time, and we'll fingerprint it so we can detect it more easily uh, when users try and upload it. Uh, that doesn't really work for live stuff, which is just why they have the problem, and it doesn't work for the video and video stuff either. Um, we're kind of right now hypothesizing that um, because Facebook and YouTube have this legal exposure, exposure problem, they're really interested in solving this versus the content creators want this problem solved, but I think it's more of a nice to have for them than a need to have, like it is for the, the video companies. Yeah. Francis. Uh, I was gonna ask a bit, a bit about the go-to-market. So um, would you, can you go back and sort of retrofit videos that already exist today, or do you have to distribute this fingerprint on videos as they're actually um, being made? Like how hard would it be to go back and uh, add this to the full video library that Facebook or content creators have? That's very easy to do. I mean, you know, it's, it's a watermarking. It's a special type of watermark is what it is. So, you know, uh, for existing content, you can watermark it, but if somebody's passing around a version that is before you watermarked it or an, an older version, uh, then there's not much to do there. Um, that said, from a technical standpoint, it's, it's very easy. So, uh, even as something's being broadcast live, you can watermark it very quickly, movies, things like that. And with the watermark, is it unique by the video or by the frame that you're looking at? Uh, you could do it by frame. So actually, um, per frame, we can embed over 1,000 bits, right? And you, know, you could do 30 frames a second if you really want to get up there. But you can, you can throw a lot of information in there so you can really know uh, what somebody's looking at. Andrew. Yeah. Where does the watermarking happen? On the cloud or on device? Who owns the data in the pipeline? Oh, so uh, you could just do the, the watermark as soon as, a, so as soon as like a video is ready to be distributed, you can watermark it at the source. Uh, and then the watermark gets decoded on a user's cell phone device. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? All right.
right. Thank you very much. Thank well you. done, Eric. Thank you to all four competitors, judges. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Um, so it's time to announce the winner of our Entrepreneurial Computer Vision Challenge. But first, we want to take a moment to thank our fantastic judges and our phenomenal competitors, and especially our sponsors for the summit, uh, or for the ECVC, um, Google Cloud, along with um, we've got Latham and Watkins, and Brex, the credit card for startups, um, and HubSpot for startups as well, who will all be offering prizes to the winner. Great, thank you. Uh, and <clears throat> hey everyone, my name is Tej. I'm from Google on a team called Google Cloud for Startups. Uh, before I announce the winner, winner, I just want to say congratulations on day one of the summit. Uh, the, the pitches and the panels are extremely cool. Cool. Uh, I kind of feel like I'm in the future, uh, which is amazing. <laughs> welcome, we to my, welcome to my life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is just like candy, uh, which is amazing, and I'm excited we have another day tomorrow. Uh, congratulations to all the contestants who pitched. Uh, we had the pleasure of seeing them at Google on Monday during the subfinals, and we also at Google had the pleasure of working um, with Abby and Evan uh, on the application process, and I saw how competitive it was. So it's really impressive to see the few that came up. Uh, and uh, we're extremely happy to support uh, the winner with $100,000 in Google Cloud credits, and obviously support in any way for everyone uh, who applied. And is it okay for me to say? Uh, absolutely, yeah. take it so, away. So uh, I'd like to announce the winner for today, uh, which is Eric from uh, Steg AI. Yeah, where uh, is he, Eric? Well done. Come on. Congrat Thank congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, congratulations. Can I get you that intro on YouTube? Yeah, let's get, come on in here for a big picture. Okay. 